welcome once more. Although I think I'm being welcomed by you more than you've been welcomed by me, actually. <laughs> so thank you for letting me share uh, the scriptures with you. I really value this. Uh, I have a great love for the scriptures and a great love for the liturgy. So uh, if I can at all assist and help people to reflect on the scriptures and, and, the, and the church's liturgy, uh, then it, I find that quite fulfilling and um, really privileged to be able to do so. So thank you. And thank you for spending the time to reflect upon scripture. And we celebrated uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Feast of St. Jerome, who translated the, the Hebrew and Greek early scriptures into, uh, into Latin, the first translation. Of course, Latin was then the, the vernacular of the, of the Western world in, the, in times of the Roman Empire. Um, and he also gave, split the scriptures into chapters and verses that we have now. That was way back in the fourth century. Anyway, um, I, why I mentioned Jerome is one of the things he said is that ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. So that's, that's at least worth remembering sometimes. It's, worth, it's important that we touch the living word of God, that is Christ Jesus, made flesh, uh, but also written down for us. So that's really important. So the Global Synod has begun. And last Sunday, in each of our dioceses around the world, it was inaugurated in our diocese. So I want to reflect a little bit about that in the light of the scriptures that we have. Um, I think I was talking about the Synod last time quite a bit. Uh, and saying what a momentous, a momentous moment, a momentous grace for the church, the great potential this has. But we have to be really open. We have to really listen. We have to really open our eyes and see. And see, particularly, listen to the voices of those who've been hurt by the church and see the suffering of those around us in the world that need us to serve them. And that's, I hope, what the Synod is going to help us to do more effectively. We have in the Gospel on this 30th Sunday of the year, we have really the, the, the final healing or miracle that Jesus works before his passion. He is on the road to Jerusalem. He leaves Jericho, moving to Jerusalem, moving to the story of the cross, moving, for instance, also to the purification of the temple, which he would do. Um, and so he is moving now inexorably to the moment of great crisis, but the moment also of the world's redemption as love, con of love conquers the brutality of the cross in the resurrection, as life overwhelms death of the crucified one. And this is the last, this encounter with the blind man. And we have his name, which is quite unusual, <clears throat> Bartimaeus. So he must have been known in the early church, otherwise his name would not have been recorded. So he must have been a, a, uh, a notable uh, follower of Jesus, a Christian, in order for his name to be there. And so there Jesus is on the, just leaving Jericho and there's a crowd around and there's this blind beggar. Blindness was seen as a great curse from God. Blindness was seen as the result of sin, either his parents' sin or his own sin. And therefore, it meant that this blind beggar was not seen as acceptable to God, acceptable in the temple, acceptable in the synagogue. So he's already an outcast. <clears throat> it also meant that he couldn't work, and therefore 
he was totally and utterly dependent upon the, the charity of others. Hence, he was condemned to a life of begging. I'm sure, well, I don't know where you all are, but you can't go very far in Bristol without seeing people begging on the street anymore. And in a rich country like ours, that is a scandal. It's a scandal of injustice. Anyway, so he is reduced to utter poverty, the kind of poverty that people look away from, don't want to see, don't want to hear their cries. And perhaps we've all done that, just passed by on the other side of somebody begging in the street. The blind beggar is shouting, Son of David, Jesus, have pity on me. Now, it's very interesting, he says, Son of David. That's the messianic title. He is recognizing Jesus. This blind man who could not see, sees clearly who Jesus is, the Messiah. When so many of the leadership were blind and could not see and refused to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. <clears throat> and it's one of the themes in the scriptures that the, it comes out very clearly in John's gospel. The blind man sees, and the seeing, those with sight, are, have an interior blindness. So <clears throat> Jesus uh, calls the man. The crowd were trying to, to stop him shouting. But instead, Jesus calls the man to him. Bring him to me, he says. And then, he's, and then they say to him, courage, courage. You know, he, this, this great guy is calling you. He is calling you. I think maybe every one of us needs to reflect on those words in the gospel. Courage. He is calling you. What's he calling you to? He's calling you to discipleship. He's calling you to model your life on him. He's calling you to recognize your own blindnesses and begin to see the world as he sees the world, to love the world with his heart. He's calling you to open your ears, to hear, to hear the cries of the poor. He's calling you. So the man jumps up, throwing off his cloak, and goes to Jesus. <clears throat> Why does Mark mention he throws off his cloak? Very interesting. These details are never put in just gratuitously. There's a reason. The early Christians were, for the first few centuries, <clears throat> when most of them were adults who were baptized, would take off all their clothes, would be baptized naked. That's why deaconesses baptized the women and deacons baptized the men. And then they were clothed in a white garment, representing their new life after baptism and taken to the bishop at the Easter Vigil for him to pray over them and anoint them, what we now call the Sacrament of Confirmation, the, the Sacraments of Initiation. So <clears throat> his throwing off the cloak is a little touch of the baptismal liturgy. This man is responding to the call, courage, he's calling you. He has the courage to let go of his old life, represented by the beggar's cloak, and to come to Jesus. What does Jesus ask, what do you want? You see, Jesus doesn't impose he listens. That's why the synod is so important. We need to listen with the ears and the heart of Christ. We need to ask people, what are, what are your expectations of the church? What are you wanting of us? We need to respond to the needs of the world, recognizing what their needs are and recognizing our responsibility to do something about those needs. We can have forms of of uh, faith and piety and religion 
that actually alienate us from the world. We think we, we become totally satisfied with all our pieties and prayers instead of seeing that our prayer life, which needs to be there, needs to be deep, our prayer life is in order to build a greater love in our hearts to be given to the world around us. So, what then Jesus does, he says, Master, let me see again. He obviously had once been able to see and something had happened and he turned blind. Jesus says, go, your faith has saved you. He had expressed that faith already when he called him the, um, uh, Jesus, son of David. He expressed that faith when he threw off his old life, the cloak. When he jumped up, eager, to come to Jesus, His faith, your faith has saved you. Well, what that really means is when we experience the saving love of God, then what grows in us is a faith that can trust God in everything. Whatever's happening in our life, good, bad or indifferent, we, we place our trust that's the essence of faith, is actually this trusting relationship in the ever-faithful love of our Father for us. Our, an absolute abandonment into the hands of God, into the heart of Jesus. And what he says is, go. Interesting. Go, your faith has saved you. And then he says, and immediately his sight returned and he followed Jesus along the way. He followed Jesus along the way. He began to see. In that baptismal moment, and it's very clearly this has got some overtones of the sacrament of baptism here. In this baptismal moment, this moment of encounter with Christ, it is enlightening. He begins to see in a new way. He has found himself. Whether it's he needed forgiveness or not. And Jesus never associates sickness with sin, by the way, ever. Never anywhere. Even with the centurion. It isn't the, the sickness of the, uh, sorry, not the centurion, of the paralyzed man. The paralysis is a symbol of what sin does to us, but the paralysis itself is not the result of sin. Immediately. Just like those first apostles on the lakeside, when Jesus calls them, they immediately left their boats and followed him. So does this man, the next generation of apostles, as it were, the next generation of missionary disciples and follows him along the way. And where does the way lead to? It leads to Jerusalem. It leads to the cross. It leads through the cross to the resurrection. There's no discipleship of Jesus without us carrying the cross. And the cross is not our sicknesses. The cross is the cost of truly witnessing to the gospel. The cost, the sacrifices we need to make in order to be true to the heart of Christ and to live in the world with the heart of Christ loving. And if we place love first in our lives, then a lot of things are going to have to be let go of. What's the cloak that we need to throw off in order to be free to follow Jesus and be those missionary disciples? The first reading, and it's a very beautiful passage from Jeremiah. <clears throat> And again, it's one of the great messianic passages. The era of the Messiah would be when all the people would be gathered back to, back to their land, to their soil. This was the great messianic promise 
I think we've often forgotten that. We think of the Messianic promise as the promise of the Messiah. No, the Messianic promise was the promise of what the Messiah would do. <laughs> and what he would do would be to gather people, set people free, liberate them from slaveries, set them free, bring them back to their own soil. And of course, at that stage, their own soil meant the soil of Israel. But of course, in Jesus, everything becomes more global and universalized. And so the soil is the soil of our real selves, the soil of our real life, who we're truly to become, the soil of the community that we're to build. It isn't, it isn't, a, it isn't the Holy Land, no. The soil is just where God plants us, in the world. The world is the soil. And with the COP26 conference um, about to start, you know, we need to come back and rediscover and see afresh the soil, the creation around us, and recognize our Christian responsibility to bring healing to creation. We have abused the earth so terribly. We have exploited it. We have used short-term profit and ignoring, being blind to the cost to future generations. We can no longer do that. We know, we see our blind, we cannot make blindness or deafness an excuse anymore. We know what we are doing to our planet. We know what we're doing to the other creatures of the earth that are being exterminated into extinction. We know what we're doing to the atmosphere by cutting down the rainforests, for instance, by polluting our oceans with plastics. We know these are part of our Christian responsibility because God has given us this beautiful creation, this beautiful blue planet beautiful planet has given it to us to care for not to dominate plunder and exploit but to care for he's given us all our brothers and sisters around the world to be one family together to build a new kind of humanity to build a new kind of human community a new kind of world that's exactly what our faith the faith that saves that's what it's calling us to. So courage is calling you. He's calling you to build a different world. He's calling you to change your own lifestyles. He's calling me to change my lifestyle too. In order that we can hand on to future generations this beautiful planet in a sustainable way. Otherwise, we sin against future generations if we don't wake up, if we don't open our eyes and see, open our eyes and hear, in the words of Pope Francis, the cries of the earth, the cries of the poor. And just as we're preparing for COP26, we have entered into this period, this two year period of synod. And the first few months of the concentration of this synod is going to be uh, in our own diocese. Every diocese, every Catholic diocese in the world. And we're called to open our eyes to see, to be prepared to see what we've been blind to. And that's going to mean, if we take this seriously, we're going to listen to uncomfortable voices we're going to listen to people who have been deeply hurt by the church. There's no healing unless we listen. And in listening, let their story bite into our priorities, calling us to change. What is it that has in the Catholic Church, as in other churches and other faiths, what is it? that has actually allowed all this abuse of people, of children and of vulnerable people to take place. The huge scandals we've had to confront. 
We want to shut our ears and not hear. We want to close our eyes and not see. But if we do that, we're condemning the church to decay, not to life. We're crucifying the church, not being part of resurrection. So this synod is about enabling us, daring, having the courage to listen to those voices, having the courage to open our eyes and see the pain and recognize that we need to change our church. In the words of Pope Francis, we need a new way of being church. This final, this final healing of Jesus is, sums up in many ways the ministry and mission of Jesus and the mission of the church. We are called, we're called to throw off the cloak of traditions we don't need in order to make way for a new life a new life and a new way of being church as well. And that's going to be really quite uncomfortable because so often we think oh, the church has always been like this, whereas the reality is it hasn't. If you know your church history, you know it hasn't. It's going to take courage to really enter into this synod, to speak our voices when we're not used to doing so. We've grown up in a church, sadly, too many of us, where our role is to, is to fill the pews, listen to the homilies, put money in the collection, and say our prayers, and then go away again. No, we are all the church. We all have a responsibility to build the church. We all have not only a responsibility, but a right and a duty. And we must not let clergy get in the way of that. Clergy are there to support and help and enable us and empower us to do that, not to replace us. We are all the people of God. We're all gifted by the Spirit. We all need to contribute to building a church fit for the 21st century. And that's going to challenge Excessive clergy power is going to challenge a church that's excessively hierarchical and needs to be much more, the whole people of God together sharing. Instead of a pyramid, what we need is like concentric circles together. That needs to be the model of the church. So I'd like to conclude by by praying for this synod that has begun. It's begun in your diocese and in mine. So let us pray. Let us pray for a spirituality of journeying together, that we may be formed as disciples of Christ, as families, communities, human beings, through our experience of this journey of synod. Lord, in your mercy, heal our, hear our prayer. Let us pray for ears that listen, for eyes prepared to see, and hearts and minds open to listen with love, especially to those who have suffered. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May this synod empower us, all of us, for participation in the mission of Christ and help us to shape a church ready to be a missionary community in the 21st century world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us <clears throat> pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us and lead us in this journey of discernment so that in listening to the voices we may distill the voice of the spirit heed what the spirit is saying to the church at this time and lovingly and obediently build that new way of being church 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So, Lord, we stand before you, seeking the breath of your Holy Spirit as we gather in your name. May your Spirit guide us. May you, you yourself make your home in our hearts as we make our home in yours. May your Holy Spirit lead us into all truth, the truth we need to be the church of the 21st century. Yes, Lord, we are weak, we are sinful, and we may be prone to division and disorder. Draw us along the paths of repentance for the ways that we have divided or wounded the church or the ways the church has wounded others. Let us journey together listening to the world around us and being ready to build anew to reform your church in the power of the spirit root and branch and we ask this through christ our lord amen and the blessing peace and healing of god father son and holy spirit come down upon you enlighten you and empower you now and always amen, amen.